Hey there students, welcome back as we continue our discussion of Louis XIV's wars, specifically focusing on the War of the Spanish Succession. If you didn't see part one and you want to, make sure to look at that. But then again, if you primarily want to learn about the War of the Spanish Succession, then let's go ahead and go right into it. The War of the Spanish Succession went from 1701 to 1714. It was the last, the longest, the largest of Louis XIV's wars and pretty much settled things as far as this goes and kind of puts into place the new balance of power that is going to predominate in the 18th century. So here is Europe in 1700. Here is Europe in 1714. You don't see very big changes. The biggest change you see, of course, is the Act of Union that united England and Scotland as one country, not just two countries with the same monarch. And then you see a few small things happening here. Spain still has the same borders, but by that time it is under new leadership, which we will discuss in the course of this lecture. Lecture. And this is the time where Charles II of Spain, the last Habsburg ruler of Spain, died without an heir. Now, there were some issues here that uh, there were some reasons why Charles II of Spain died without an heir. And that is because Charles II of Spain was inbred. Now, I'm not just talking about like a little bit inbred or something like that, like oops, you know, I didn't realize you were my third cousin or second cousin or whatever, which is really not necessarily biologically toxic. Now, what is biologically toxic is when you are what Reddit calls inbred level five. Okay, that just sounds awful, all right? Level five inbred. As we go through here, we see that you know, we see Philip II married to his niece. We see first cousins. We see second cousins. Second cousins, again, uh, socially unacceptable, but biologically, maybe not so much of a problem. But then when it happens again, uncle, niece, second cousins, first cousins, first cousins again, another uncle and a niece. And then we finally get to Charles II of Spain. <laughs> And it's like, wow, like you just won some sort of negative inbred lottery. Charles was sterile, unlike his counterpart, Charles II of England and Scotland, who was far from sterile. But when we look at Charles, we can see here the trademark Habsburg chin, Habsburg jaw. It is very, very pronounced. So all of these features become very pronounced. Uh, because of this inbreeding and at some point mother nature has had enough and mother nature turns off the tap there will be no inbred level six all right that that's done well where is it going to go from here in charles ii's will he willed the throne to louis the 14th's grandson now, for Louis XIV, that's great. For the rest of Europe, not so much. Why not? Because of the balance of power. Because if you put a Bourbon monarch in Spain, then what's going to happen when Louis XIV dies? Does Louis XIV leave his kingdom to the same monarchy? Do we see a combined monarchy of France and Spain? Do we see France and Spain combining in the same way that England and Scotland combined? And the rest of Europe is not really liking this and the implications for the balance of power. And so the Grand Alliance mobilizes again Britain, Austria, Prussia, the Dutch Republic, Portugal, and Savoy, and they all attack France and Spain. So, as Voltaire said, the king was surrounded by enemies on all sides. And, and this is really like, if you want to think about the sheer awesomeness of Louis, that he really should have been defeated. He should have been defeated decisively going against every major power of Europe. But that is not what happened. Although Louis and his armies faced defeats early on at the hands of the Duke of Marlborough, 
Louis was able to fight the Grand Alliance to a draw. So in spite of some early defeats, Louis is able to save France and he's able to bring his enemies to the negotiating table to come up with a fair settlement at Utrecht in the Dutch Republic. So in 1714, the Treaty of Utrecht not only ends the War of the Spanish Succession, but it is the end of all of Louis XIV's wars. And there are three things that you really need to know about this treaty. Now, first of all, a Bourbon monarch will rule in Spain, but the French and the Spanish kings must renounce claims to the other throne. This is to prevent a unified Bourbon monarchy. Now, just a little trivia, today the Bourbon monarchy is still reigning in Spain. Spain has a constitutional monarchy much like the UK. And so there still is a Bourbon monarch in Spain, although no longer in France. So, fine, Bourbons, you can have two crowns, but they're going to have to be two crowns we don't want it to we don't want them to unite the second provision is that france is restricted to the pre-war border so louis did not lose any territory but he did not gain any territory either as a result of this war now louis has gotten what he wanted He's got a Bourbon monarch on the Spanish throne. The Habsburgs no longer control Spain. He has influenced the balance of power. Then what do the British get? Well, the British get Gibraltar from Spain, which is still under British control as of 2016. You might have heard something about it when you were looking at the specifics of the Brexit vote that you know 95% of people in Gibraltar voted against Brexit but that is still a British overseas territory now the British really were very forward thinking because Louis is concerned about these vain dynastic sort of things who's going to be the king of this who's going to be the king of that the British are more concerned about naval supremacy the British get Gibraltar which is going to be a major naval base for them. It's going to control access to the Mediterranean Sea. This is around where the epic battle of Trafalgar is fought during the Napoleonic Wars between the combined French and Spanish fleets and Admiral Lord Nelson's British fleet. So the British are really thinking forward. They're not thinking about petty dynastic concerns. They're thinking about power and not just a European balance of power but a global balance of power because British naval superiority is going to mean a lot for the world in the centuries to come. So Britain would become the great maritime power of the 18th and 19th centuries and I would say that part of this is because of the decline of the Dutch Republic but the other part is because the British were very forward thinking here and they're thinking about naval supremacy. And so here is Europe in seven. 1714. As I noted, the Act of Union has created one country of England and Scotland, and at that time, Ireland. And Spain is governed by a Bourbon monarch, and then France is still governed by Louis' Bourbon dynasty and has made no change from when the war started. That is the War of the Spanish Succession. Now, in the next installment, I'm going to particularly discuss the historiography of Louis' wars, what did he accomplish, and just kind of go into some interpretive stuff. If you want to hang around for that, then go ahead and click through, and if not, I certainly appreciate you watching this segment. It's always a pleasure.